Thank you, sir. So uh, I'll first begin by thanking the Academy for having me here, as well as all the local organizers for their hospitality. I'll today be giving a presentation on chemistry with bigger atoms. Uh, now, the idea is not to take atoms from lower and lower down the periodic table, but rather to do something else entirely, which is to try to see quantum dots and try to use them as atoms. We have already had an excellent introduction to quantum dots from yesterday. So I'll just recap. What we want is, what we, only, what we need to remember is that quantum dots are essentially spheres made of semiconductor. They have a nice shell of ligands on top. And what I'll try to do is, I won't try to convince you, but I'll just state that this is the case. We can approximate them really, really well by simply thinking of them as particles in a box. So even though this is a really complex system, it can be made devoid of all its complexity and reduced to a particle in a box. This seems like a crude approximation, but empirically we know it turns out really, really well. If you are thinking now of a particle in a box, we immediately know we have uh, wave functions which sort of look like 1s, 1p, 1d, etc. These have a very strong similarity to what are the hydrogenic orbitals, 1s, 2s, 2p. We can definitely say that there is this similarity. There is no great reason for the similarity. We are dealing with spherically symmetric systems, hence the similarity develops. But nonetheless, looking at this, at some point of time in the history of quantum dot literature, the term artificial atom was coined simply because of this existing spherical symmetry. Uh, if we try to summarize the similarities and differences between quantum dots and atoms, quantum dots are large. They are around 10 nanometers in diameter as compared to atoms which are 100 times smaller. And at the same time, the energy level spread of quantum dots is really tiny. So quantum dot energy levels are roughly say 0.3 EV apart in the maximum case, while in the case of atoms, we are dealing with levels which are say 10 EV or more apart. What this means is an atom resembles a dot when compared to a quantum dot and at the same time the energy levels of a quantum dot look like these two thick lines when compared to the energy levels of an atom. So that is basically the comparison and then of course there comes the criticism, why should we call them artificial atoms at all and, and is that comparison actually justified? This certainly is a daunting problem from the point of view of chemistry because as chemists we like to think of atom as anything which can react. And so the obvious question is can a quantum dot be made to react and that is the question which we set out to answer. So our approach was as follows, we start off with a quantum dot which is made out of a wide gap semiconductor and we introduce a dopant state into it. By default this dopant state does nothing at all, it just sits there because it cannot interact in any way with the ground state. What do we do next? Well, now we bring a quantum dot, another quantum dot, a different type of quantum dot close to it. But the idea is pick this quantum dot in such a way so that it can dump some charges into this dopant state. As soon as we, these two dots are now brought close enough, immediately there is a charge transfer and we now have a charge separation. So now we have two charges, a negative and a positive charge occurring on the quantum dots. But this is not an excited state tra charge transfer. I must emphasize this is a ground state effect. So now in the ground state, we have two charged quantum dots. And the interesting thing is these charges are now residing on a new type of state. These are residing on the 1s, 1p states of, the, of these quantum dots, which sort of resemble hydrogenic orbitals, but we know they are not quite like that. And that's what's interesting. This transfer charge creates all sorts of spectroscopic features. I will not go into the details, but simply state their names. Uh, we have things like PL uh, quenches, bleaches occurring in the absorbance. In, uh, we have new absorption bands which turn up all of which confirm that there is this charge transfer and we can do more than that. We can even use spectroscopy to actually measure the electric fields which are generated inside such solids and we find and we can actually study therefore and we can really prove that this charge transfer has indeed occurred. Once we believe that there is this charge transfer and we can even measure the electric fields, there comes the next point. Now we have two opposite charges sitting right next to each other and obviously we know what is the next thing that is going to happen. They start having a strong coulomb interaction or a coulomb pull between them. This is conceptually no different from what happens in the case of a compound like sodium chloride. It is the same thing but happened in a scaled up system. So what is the result? These forces, these coulomb forces are strong enough to drag these quantum dots out of solution. When we start, these quantum dots are soluble in solvents like hexane, but by the time the charge transfer occurs, they form these precipitates which consists of quantum dots simply aggregated together because of the coulomb forces. Uh, what have we done essentially so far? If we think about what we have done, there were already quantum dot solids which were in existence. They had been made by either Van der Waals forces or there, were or there were these hydrogen bonded solids and so on. Into that we have thrown a new beast. We have thrown in these idea of having coulomb bound quantum dot solids. This does not seem to be a great thing. After all, this is already something which exists. We have added another beast into that. So what really is the 
excitement or the great thing about them. Well, let's just do a back of the envelope calculation. Let's consider what happens if we have two quantum dot size spheres, which are charged like these quantum dots are at a certain dist distance apart. Well, we'll find that the force of attraction which exists between these spheres is pretty massive. This will be of the order of hundreds of electron volts if we are considering these forces in vacuum, uh, we are considering this in vacuum, that's a very large interaction energy. This is so large that any chemical bond by comparison is dwarfed by it. That's a pretty strange thing. And the second thing is the range with which these forces and uh, you know, bonds or interactions occur is also very, very large, obviously larger than any known chemical bond and that is what is so exciting about them. Uh, there is of course a small caveat here, I am considering this exercise simply in vacuum. If I were to imply dielectric screening, I would have to divide this by a good number and this number does go down. However, I will still add that in the all circumstances, even in the worst case scenario, we are still dealing with forces or bond energies which are 10 times larger than any chemical bond. This is of course a fantastical number and we would like to actually see if such a thing happens. Now while I cannot pull the quantum dots apart yet. But what we did do was we actually did some basic calorimetry and the idea was well we took a certain quantum dot solid, this was a lead selenide cadmium selenide quantum dot which was reacted with another quantum dot. They react in a ratio of 1 is to 1.66 and now we try to evaluate what is the heat of formation. What do we find? Well we find that we have a heat of formation in the case of quantum dots which is 64 megajoules per mole. Now that is a very very large number. If we think of something like sodium chloride it is only 411 kilojoules per mole. So we are orders of magnitude above what something like sodium chloride does. Before we start changing our minds, you know, looking at these numbers, it sounds very tempting. Let's just start using quantum dots and use them to run cars and watches and batteries and so on and so forth. That's actually not such a productive idea at all because in some sense these numbers are misleading a little bit. The reason is these are per mole of quantum dot. Quantum dots are large massive objects. If I were to divide them by the appropriate masses, these numbers look a lot less fantastical. They are simply 62 joules per gram of quantum dot. And at the same time, if I will compare this with sodium chloride, I am dealing with 7000 joules per gram. So there is still no reason to go to quantum dots and start using them as fuels. But certainly, if we think of them as a single unit or a single entity, these numbers are massive. Since these are two objects simply interacting with each other with these very strong forces of interaction, uh, this basically means their energetics and their behavior becomes very, very different. They no longer form crystalline architectures, but rather there is an overwhelming tendency to actually form glasses. So these materials should not be likened to sodium chloride perhaps, but they are more like soda lime glass or sodium calcium silicate. The more interesting question though is, well we are thinking of these materials as you know, an example of a chemical transformation, but can we really verify that or can we really make that claim? The answer is Surprisingly, yes. The reason is because the most fundamental property of a chemical transformation is the existence of a definite stoichiometry. If I take random amounts of various reactants, I still expect to get a compound which is very distinctive. And that is exactly what we see. So what we are doing here, we are taking random amounts or fixed amounts, sorry, of quantum dot A and a very random amount of quantum dot X. When we combine them, we find that the resultant product always contains A and X in roughly the same ratio. Here it is varying from 1.5 to 2.2, hovering around 1.8 essentially even though the ratios actually have been changed by a factor of 5. So we can base say that the concept of stoichiometry pretty much, much holds and this is more or less an example of a chemical reaction. We can really quantify it over a large number of sample classes which we have done and this becomes very interesting and exciting at this point because now we must really say or find out why this actually occurs. This is a question which seems deceptive, it seems deceptively simple to say why there should be a stoichiometry, but in fact the answer is quite difficult. The first and foremost explanation which we could have given would have been packing effects. When we have these assemblies forming, these would have a natural excluding type effect. But when we think about it, whatever evidence I have shown little bit, suggests that these are actually impossible. This explanation is impossible because these are actually disordered solids, so there cannot be a packing effect which accounts for that. The Second answer could be, well, this is just shell filling. Shell filling is what happens in atoms and after all I did call quantum dots artificial atoms a moment ago. But when we think about that, this too is not a good enough explanation. The reason is because for quantum dots, as we already saw, the levels are pretty close to each other and in fact they are so very close that when we start thinking of quantum dots combining with each other, the probability that there will be a fluctuation in stoichiometry, meaning quantum dot A will react with two members of quantum dot B, 
turns out to be roughly 10 to the 12 times if shell filling were to be the only criterion. This basically means we would get all kinds of random quantum dot mixtures, but never a true quantum dot compound. So what really is going on? We decided to investigate this matter further. Uh, we constructed sort of a phenomenological model where we had a Born-Haber cycle analog for quantum dots. And what we find is individual terms over here, here n square is the number of electrons which are participating. And we found that each term roughly ends up empirically to be around one electron volt in size. Now that's a very important parameter because this relationship allows us to guess all kinds of things. To so to describe to you why stoichiometry exists still in quantum dots, because it seems to be a big mystery, the reason is something like this. Let's just consider an AB2 type solid. So we have quantum dots firstly nicely occurring in an AB2 type fashion, one A and two Bs. And now I pull out one of the B spheres. So I'm pulling out one of the blue spheres. The result is now I must redistribute the charge associated with it. And when I do that, I quickly find that the energy associated with the charge redistribution is actually simply n square by 2. Now what happens in quantum dot solids is n ends up being a very large number and this ensures that the energy of creation of such a defect where instead of AB2 I have an AB, this energy ends up being very very massive, it's 0.5 electron volts. So the final answer is very very surprising. It's impossible to create a stoichiometric defect because of purely classical considerations. It's classical electrostatics which is saying you cannot make an error and convert an AB2 into an AB. Surprisingly, there's no quantum mechanics anywhere involved at all. This seems to be a, yet again an interesting claim. So let's just think about it a bit more. Supposing we were doing this exercise with sodium chloride. This will of course be a thought experiment. Let's think what happens if we pull apart a sodium chloride lattice. We know quite well the answer. Even though we can't do the experiment, we kind of know that if we did that, the stoichiometry of the material will always persist. Sodium chloride will stay Na1Cl1. Now let's try to think about what will happen and we know that that will happen because simply shell filling is the one which is dictating everything. As long as there is shell filling, this stoichiometry is conserved because quantum mechanics is guiding everything. Now what happens if we pull apart a quantum dot solid? Now in this case of course something totally different happens. We go to our own old equation and we try to make a series of approximations and uh, try to pull something out. We find that the stoichiometry, here I define that as y where I'm making a compound which is A, X, Y, A and X are quantum dots, I find that Y is actually a function of separation, meaning the more I pull apart the quantum dots, the more the stoichiometry will change because this is now a purely classical effect. The nice thing with it is I can change it from a thought experiment into a real experiment. Now I could never do this with a real ionic solid, but I can with a quantum dot solid. The way we did it is somewhat tricky. We take a quantum dot, we put an inert passivating shell on top and we keep changing the thickness of this shell. This essentially ensures that we, that we are continuously changing the lattice parameter, so to speak, of this solid and the result is immediately obvious. We find that this relationship describes this behavior of these quantum dots rather beautifully and in fact the stoichiometry changes with the separation. So this is effectively doing an experiment of pulling apart a solid, ionic solid continuously without really interrupting or doing anything. This of course has very strange implications and very strange connotations. When we think about it more and more, what we are really seeing is a twofold things. One is that the forces which are between quantum dots are not really purely Coulomb like, rather the effective force is a very different force from a Coulomb force. And the reason why this effective force is different is because even though we have already spoken on the matter quantum dots appear to have a very nicely defined stoichiometry. They are having the stoichiometry without having any associated valence. If you have two quantum dots and you move them together or apart, their valence changes continuously. The stoichiometry will change slightly here and there as well, but the important point is the change which occurs in the valence is much more massive. This is a very strange bunch of things which I have said and it also becomes a question is it all just an interesting thought experiment or all an interesting puzzle or something nice can come out of it. Well the only situation which we see nice things coming out of it is if we can take this chemistry and go somewhat further. What I have been talking about most of the time right now has been just this simple formation reaction A plus B going to AB to quantum dots reacting and falling out. What we can do are now somewhat complicated reactions as well. These are not really complicated, but they are, we are at least getting somewhere with them. Uh, the most complicated reaction we have tried so far is this idea of elimination, where we take an AB2 type solid and then add quantum dot C to it and C basically kicks B out back into solution. Uh, this is analogous to say taking an iron nail, dipping it into copper chloride and getting iron chloride and releasing copper. 
and that's exactly what happens. So over here what is occurring is we are starting with an AB precipitate. We have the quantum dot uh, C being added. This is quantum dot C and eventually we get quantum dot AC, uh, quantum dot B being released back into solution and a new precipitate. This happens roughly quantitatively and that's why this is sort of exciting because there are two ways of thinking about it. One way I can just simply think of, well, you are just doing this reaction now with a larger set of atoms, that's all. The other way to realize this is quantum dots are actually assemblies consisting of thousands and thousands of atoms each. And what that ends up meaning is we are having a very quantitative display of reversible binding and pref binding preferences in assemblies that consist of very large numbers of atoms, which is rather surprising. Because to my knowledge, this does not occur outside of biology for assemblies this large. Uh, so I'll at this point conclude since my time is up. What I've tried to show is quantum dots do react the same way as atoms if we try to make them to. And this essentially lets them have a chemistry, but this is guided by a very different set of rules. And this, while though very rudimentary, is promising. We at least have two examples of reactions so far. But what we really hope for one day is to have the quantum dot analog for carbon, and then this will get really, really exciting. I'll thank the person who did all the work, that is Rekha. So she's highlighted here. I'll thank the funding agencies and also Professor D.D. Sharma who had nominated me for this. And uh, thank you all for your attention.